Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday night video here at Kingsway Church. Right? Yep, Wednesday night. Here we are again. We're back again, and uh, I have the honor this evening of having my daughter, my newly married daughter, Lauren Hockey, with us. And uh, she's going to help me on, uh, on, on bringing you a message tonight that I believe is timely and uh, things that I think are need to, gonna be, need to be discussed and talked about. Obviously, many of you know we're in a mess right now. Not a, we went from coronavirus and noticed that there's not a lot of people talking about coronavirus today. Uh, unfortunately, we're talking about some, some terrible events and so that are going on. And so we're going to discuss that just a little bit. But the series that I had started on Wednesday nights was called Christianity. And so I want to start off with reading a verse first in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. It says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. Now, that, that's talking about like from a Christian viewpoint. If you're a citizen of heaven, it means that you have ascribed to Christian philosophy. And it says, conducting yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the good news about Christ, then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit, one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Now notice... In that scripture, he says that we're to stand together to, to represent Christianity in a way that is befitting. And notice that he did not break down a, a skin color. He didn't talk about a particular you know, race, uh, this particular race, and not that particular race. He referenced uh, everybody. The, the message that he's saying in this particular verse is talking about Everybody, anybody that uh, subscribes to Christianity. So that could be that could be white, that could be black, that could be Asian, Hispanic, it could be any nationality, any place in the world. It could be Haitian, it could be Jew, uh, Christian, Messianic Jews, it could be anybody that has subscribed to the message of Christianity, and that we should stand up for what what is right that represents Jesus. And there's a whole lot of things that are happening right now that aren't representing Jesus. Uh, some, you know, that uh, the, the beginning, let's talk about this a little bit. And then I want to tell a, a little story about a movie that, that is so relevant, I think, that I think will help us to get some insight. First, let's talk about this situation with George Floyd and seeing the officer. And I'm normally one of these guys that I'm always like, before... I make an assessment, especially things on TV, I usually want to see and hear all the facts. I'm, I'm that kind of guy. I don't want to jump to conclusions because sometimes we jump to conclusions and we go, oh, well, there was more information. And in some cases, that has been the case. It looked like it was one way, and then reality was that later there were more parts to the story that we needed to hear in order to make a full assessment. In this particular instance, I don't think that I need to see much more. Um, you know, a picture, the Bi or not the Bible, but uh, uh, many people say a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think in this instance, a picture is worth a thousand words. I think it's completely and utterly obvious that the uh, officer that was involved in George Floyd's death is, uh, it's inexcusable. I, I just don't know any other way to say it. It's inexcusable and I think the right thing has, has, has been done, that he's been charged. And we can argue that the charge should be greater, higher, more severe. And, and I'm not sure, I, I'm not an attorney and I don't know the answer to that because sometimes people make charges based on what they can prove and I'm not sure uh, the value of all that because I don't have insight into that. But at a minimum, I, I, he has been charged and we suspect that Probably the other three officers may s receive some type of charge as well in, in the near future. So it is heinous, it is outrageous, it is unconscionable, it is unacceptable for our society. And I believe that uh, we should stand up with the black community because the one thing that I don't know what that's like is I, I, I it's easy for, it'd be easy for me to say, I. I kind of feel your pain or I know what you're going through, but I really don't and, and I can't. 
I can't know what that's like. So um, all I can say is this, from the viewpoint, from my eyes, from my viewpoint, it is, it's unacceptable and something has to be done. And I think at least the start has been done. So for the folks that wanted to go protest, I was, I was with you. I would, I would have, I would have said, I, 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 I'm with you. I think that that should be done. That that's the kind of thing that raises awareness and and says that these kind of things are unacceptable. But the problem is, it's escalated into something now that has taken away the the uh, the perspective and the and the focus on George Floyd and his death. And now it's turned into something that isn't really about him. And so we're going to talk about that just a little bit as well. Yeah, just on that end, even, uh, you know, there's been reports and media coverage of his family even asking for, you know, the rioting True. to end and that it, you know, didn't honor his life. True. And so even from their perspective, they would like to see this end so that the focus can be back on the changes that need to take place. And we're going to talk more about that as we go along here just a little bit this evening. So... I was reminded, and I was talking to Lauren earlier about this when we decided that we were going to talk about this this evening, uh, because we're talking about Christians. We're talking about what a Christian should do, what a Christian should think, the type of responses that a Christian should have. And, uh, and uh, so when we see these kind of things, the, the, we have to judge it based upon where we're at from a Christian viewpoint. But there was a movie that I saw, it was a number of years ago, actually it was a movie that Debbie talked me into going and seeing, I really didn't want to see it, it was one of those that later I had to go, okay, it was really awesome, and I had to admit that I was wrong, and the movie was called A Time to Kill, and it has uh, 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 Matthew McConaughey in it, Sandra Bullock, and uh, Samuel L. Jackson are the primary uh, folks in it but there there's there's actually it's it's even got uh Kiefer Sutherland Kiefer Sutherland Ashley Judd yeah. um so it had a lot of big name people in it and the story is about a uh Matthew McConaughey is an attorney in a small town in the south and uh in a in a somewhat uh predominant black community and there was in the time period of like the 50s no, right no it was more like the 70s oh, okay the 70s yeah. more, more like the 70s and uh and so it's a it's a you know uh, a, a largely a black community but uh but still very you know in a time where there's struggles still uh, more so maybe even than, uh, than today and we and i will say we have made strides but that doesn't mean we're there yet. We need to keep working towards that because racism is, to me, the most ugly, stupid, ignorant thing that anybody can can be. It's like, and I'm going to talk about that. I got a revelation on that. I was sharing with Lauren just a few minutes ago about what uh, what I believe the Lord showed me um, uh, last night, and I, and I took some notes on it. But let me kind of go back to the movie a little bit. So in this movie... There's this young girl that her mother sends to the grocery store. I'm going to ruin the movie for you, so if yes. you want to see it, you might want to turn me off and then say, I'll come back and watch this later. This is your spoiler alert. Yes, this, we're going to kill it for you. So this little girl looks like to be maybe like 10 years old or something like that. Her mother sends her to the grocery store to, to, um, to get some things, and she, she goes and gets a couple of bags of a variety of different things, and she's walking home. And uh, uh, Kiefer Sutherland plays a bad guy in this. And he's a white racist and, uh, and with some other people in, in, that, that he was with. And so they come across this little girl. And so they stop and uh, they do terrible things to her. They rape her. They, um, they beat her. They, they throw her off of a bridge thinking that she's dead. They throw full beer cans at her. And that when when she would be hit with one of those beer cans, it literally had cut her to the bone. It's just a tremendously disturbing movie in that in that sense. And when her but she survives, and they didn't know that she survived, and so she goes to the hospital. And when her dad, who was an upstanding man, a hardworking man at a at a uh, uh, like a log mill, uh, uh, finds out about it, he goes to the hospital. 
and uh, he knows the boys that, that did it. And so you can just see that he's angry. And he goes to Matthew McConaughey, and he's, he references a, a previous case, and asks him, he says, you helped, you saw those, uh, those boys do something like this before, and, and you, they got off, didn't they? And he said, yes, they did. And he said, if I ever needed you, and his name is Jake, Matthew McConaughey, I just remember that. His name is Jake. He said, Jake, if I ever needed you, would you, would you help me? And he said, of course. And so Samuel Jackson goes to the courthouse at the close of the day, and he takes a shotgun, and he goes and he hides in the, like the janitor's closet. And the next day when they arrested the two boys, and they're getting ready to arraign them, he opens the closet and starts shooting, and he kills uh, both of the uh, people that that had uh, raped uh, his daughter and hurt his daughter and and uh, j j did all those terrible things. So the whole movie is about Matthew McConaughey defending Samuel Jackson, Jackson, and he obviously committed a terrible crime in killing someone, but it was that his frustration level had gotten to the place that he didn't feel like that he would get justice for his daughter brutal you know rape and brutal beating and and all the heinous things they had even urinated on her it was just so degrading and so disgusting to imagine that those kind of things actually did happen to a human being and so uh towards the end of the movie jake is feeling like he doesn't he doesn't think he's going to win and it's an all-white jury and so he feels like there's just no way to win and Samuel Jackson says to him at the night before the, the final, the closing arguments, he says, the, the reason I chose you, he even turned down uh, help from the NAACP uh, that was offering to, to uh, you know, uh, defend him. And he said, no, I don't want a black attorney. I want Matthew McConaughey, I want Jake. I want a white attorney. And he said, the reason I chose you is because you think like them. He said, you don't think so. You don't mean to. You, you try not to, but you do. You still think white, and you don't see black as equal, even though you want to. And he said, so I need you to help the jury to see differently. I need you to, to recognize that they see like you, and you've got to change them. Help them see what I saw. And that was a really defining moment in the movie because at that moment, he knows what he's going to do, and so he begins his opening or his closing arguments, and he begins to tell the story. He says something like this: He says, "I want to tell you a little story, and all the story I told you about the little girl." He he shares it, but he says there was a little girl that was walking home. She had went to the store to get her mother's groceries. She's walking home innocent. She's pure. Um, uh, you know, she's young, and somebody comes along, and they pull over. They brutally rape her, and he gets very vivid and very descriptive. He says, you know, talking about each one taking turns, and he said thrust after thrust, they're just raping her and taking their turns with that and, and have destroyed her womb to where she could never have children later. And he said then once they was done, they, they urinate on her. They hang her. They throw her off a bridge thinking that she's dead. They throw full beer cans at her cutting her flesh open to the bone and thinking that she's dead they leave her for dead and he said now he told him when he began that story he said I want you to close your eyes sometimes that helps you to be able to visualize and see the story taking place and so they've got their eye the jury has their eyes closed and he's telling that story and then at the very end of the story he says now I want you to imagine she's white and you could tell in the, in the movie, it was so moving, it was so emotional that you could just tell that it, it hit people because they had not thought of that child from the perspective of white. They thought about her in the perspective of black and they can't relate. They can't relate to what it would be like to see a child be so mistreated. And I think sometimes that that's the way that we are as well. We don't we can't relate. We want to. We want to relate, but we. It's difficult to relate because we're not there. And some of the experiences that black people have been through, we we don't. And so, 
I, 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 as much as I can, I understand the anger. I understand the frustration, and I'm with you as much as I can be. But that said, there also comes a moment where we, as leaders, we have to realize we, I, I, I want to call on leaders in our community and leaders in our state to recognize that we need the people that are that are the, our white leaders. We need to to try to to emphasize or em, see through empathy the 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 perspective of what that would be like, and recognize it's not a small thing. It's a it's a terrible thing, and it's got to stop. We have to begin to see people as people. We have to begin to see people as God's creation, whatever color, whatever nationality, whatever uh, country you come, wherever you come from, if you're a human being, you're, you're a creation of God. There's no difference in that person other than their skin color. And then we have to call on the black community as well to say that for the black leaders, stand up for what is right. Yes, yes, let's protest. Yes, let's stand to get the, against the injustices. But then we have to stand up and say, but, but burning a building down is not acceptable. In, in, in some cases, you're burning down buildings that are minority-owned and, and operated, and you're hurting your own community, and you're, and you're hurting people. It's, it's not about that. that. That's not a solution. That's a problem. You're adding to the problem. You're not, you're not fixing. You're not helping make the solution. And so this stuff that we're seeing on the streets of these major cities has to stop as well we we cannot continue to see buildings being burned down and and then injustices being done with people being hurt and in some cases even being killed i heard about the uh, uh, uh the retired uh, police officer police chief i think maybe in st louis who is a who is a, a black man was killed uh, defending somebody else's property so there's no justice in that that this has been lost the idea of uh, George Floyd, all that's been lost to these other things, and it takes away from the thing that we should be focused on and recognizing the injustices and getting to a place to where we see more and more significant change so that we can address the continued issues of racism. Yeah, I think um, I think it's hard, um, and it, it's not an excuse. I, I think it's difficult being from Ashland, Kentucky, where we are a predominantly non-black community uh, we're I mean predominantly a white community and it can sometimes feel I think like these situations like George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery just to name two of the most recent uh, incidents it can feel like they're we're so far removed from that because we don't experience it and we don't see it in our own community not to say that racism doesn't happen here um, uh -huh. I'm sure that it does but it's it just it like it just feels we're removed from that because it's not so prevalent and we don't have a, a huge black community right. but with that story you know of the movie a time to kill I think that's the how we have to put ourselves in the situation of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery to say what if George Floyd was our brother or our dad or our son and the right. same with Ahmed Arbery what if he was our best friend or, you know, our cousin, brother, sister, you know, whatever. And it changes the narrative when you put yourself like, what if that was my dad? You know, what if that was my sister? And yeah. I can guarantee I would be severely hurting. And I think that that is how the black community, as much as I can infer and assume and gather I think that's how the black community feels at large, not just with these specific incidents, but probably for generations have felt that way. Yes, and that's why that we need to, I think that is a, a great perspective that we need to see that and imagine that in order to get as much perspective as we can, because I can't, just like I've used the example before, I can't imagine what it's like, like to give birth. I, I can't. I mean, I, there, I just don't, it's not possible. There, it's, obviously, it's not in my makeup, so I can't do it. In the, and in the same measure, I can't imagine being, you know, black because I'm not. But we need to make the effort to imagine, what if that was my brother? What if that was my dad? What, what if that was my daughter in the, in the movie? If that was you... And, 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 and that had happened and, and, and 
we were of a black descent and that happened, I would have felt the same way that Samuel Jackson felt. I would want to kill somebody. I would want to stop them. And we have to recognize that that's the way it feels. And so we need to work hard because, look, let's, let's remember, it, as Christians, we're supposed to love everybody. We're, we're supposed to have no differences. There, there's, we're not supposed to see color. We're not supposed to see nationality. What we're supposed to see is humanity and love for humanity and a desire to help humanity and make humanity be better. And the only way that we're ever going to do that is to have more of Jesus involved in our lives. And that brings me to the point. Last night I was thinking about this as we were getting ready. And sometimes through the night, I, it feels like the Lord speaks to me sometimes through the night, sometimes in the shower. My two most uh, seemingly moments to where God begins to share some things with me. But like at 3 in the morning I woke up and I got my phone out and I'm typing you know these things up and so that I wouldn't forget them but this was kind of what came to me is what is the influence behind racism what causes racism obviously you could say it's stupid and it is you'd say it's ignorance and I'd say it's more stupid than ignorant but but both yes all of that but what is the driving force behind it and I'd submit that it's really two things it is the spirit of antichrist it is opposing Christ's teachings. You don't see Jesus ever in any way showing a, a racial divide. He never talks in terms of, of different races. He talks about in terms of human, humanity. And so I would say that the spirit of Antichrist, the devil, is always trying to pit us one against the other. And so any influence to racism certainly comes from him. But then it also comes from the sin nature that is in us. Now watch this. When you have the sin nature in you, and we all do, the one thing that always tries to creep in, and it's one of the most dangerous things, I've preached so many messages about this, and I think it is one of the biggest dangers in, in a person's life, and not just in this area, but in, in other areas as well, and that is pride. There is such a significance to recognizing pride in your life and the danger that it, that it can do and the damage that it can do in your life is so significant and here's what the Lord shared with me that uh, racism comes from prideful thinking of more highly of yourself than you ought so in other words racism says this it says I is a white and I and I can't even I mean I'm kind of white but I'm also Hispanic you know my mom is a hundred percent Hispanic you know and my dad is, he's gringo, man. He's, he's a white gringo. So I'm kind of somewhere in between, but I was certainly raised in a, in a white environment, a, uh, the culture of white. But, but here's the thing. If I think more highly of myself being what I am, then it makes me or has the potential to cause me to look down on somebody that isn't, that doesn't look like me, that doesn't have what I have in the sense of, of my, my makeup as a body and it makes me think that somehow or another I'm more important than somebody else and it can actually be it can be on either side yeah. there, there, are, there are some black folks that think more highly of themselves than they should and it turns into racism reverse and then white people think more highly of themselves than they should and it turns into racism to minorities or it could even be another country. We can also tend to be that way. And don't, don't misunderstand me. I think America is a wonderful country. And I won't apologize for its exceptionalism and all the wonderful things that, that, that America represents. However, that said, sometimes America can come off as better than anybody else. We may have, in some cases, better ideas, a better structure, you know better opportunities but that does not mean that we are better as people people we, we're not a better you know human just because we're an American than somebody else so we have to be careful to thinking more highly of ourselves than we should and recognizing that everybody has been made in the image and in the likeness of God and we should love and respect that and when you have a bad cop and they're not all bad folks I want to say really quick they're not all bad 
in fact about it I would say that many and most are are good and they they do it in a noble way in a noble profession but the problem is you get one you get one guy and it causes all of this upheaval and 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 it's unfortunate uh, that that one person can put a stain on on police officers of who I have great admiration and respect for generally speaking in this particular instance justice has to be served and he has to be held accountable um, I think also it's important because, again, like we've said, it's hard for for white people to put ourselves in the shoes of black people and what they have gone through, not just what they're going through right now, but historically, like everything that they've gone through. I'm going to... Um, We'll put a slide up here in just a second for you to see, but I saw this on social media the other day, and if you guys have been on social media in the past week, couple days, I don't know if you feel this way, but I certainly do. I feel a bit paralyzed on what to say, what to post. Do I say anything? Do I not say anything at all? Both, Both ways it feels wrong. If I do say something, then it feels like I'm doing the wrong thing, but then if I don't say something, it feels like I'm agreeing with every, it's a paralyzing position to be in, I think. Um, But one of the things that I saw was this, um, again, we'll put this slide up, it's a a graph of a timeline of American slavery, segregation, and like where we're at now. So from 1526 to 1865, the year 1526 to 1865, was American slavery. And then segregation started in 1865, and that went to 1954, so approximately 100 years, thereabouts. And then from 1954 to today, that's where we are now. But when you look at this graphic, I think it kind of paints a picture of, of something that white people do not relate to. It's something that, like, we have never had to deal with being enslaved in the way that, you know, African Americans, black people have been enslaved. We haven't had to deal with the prejudice that comes with segregation that we lived through from 1865 to 1954. So I think what's happening today and like the protesting and the rioting, not to make an excuse for the rioting, there, there is no excuse um, you know, for tearing down businesses, for inadvertently, uh, you know, a black man being shot in St. Louis. Like, there, there's no excuse for that. But I think what we're experiencing today, it's not just an effect of what has happened in the past week or the past couple months, but it's looking at it long term as to what black people have experienced for generations upon generations. Yeah, I agree. And actually, Pastor Jason, as we were just getting ready to to um, go into this broadcast, made an, a, another interesting point as well. Um, and I don't want to open up that can of worms too deep because it'd take too long. But we've we've been on lockdown. People have been in their homes and not allowed to go out and do anything. And and there's a certain it's like a pressure cooker mm-hmm. when people are confined, and then and then all it takes sometimes is a spark to just cause something to break loose and so I think so many things have contributed to this that has led us to this place but at the end of the day what we hope to be able to accomplish at least in our community is say look as much as possible we're trying to empathize and I think it was very well said that it's like I don't know what to say I don't if I say this and it then it feels like you know I haven't said enough and I if I go too far then it feels like that I'm almost like jumping on a bandwagon or something so it's it's a very difficult situation but what we do want you to know is we love you we are we we're heartbroken when we see the things that we've saw and we're with you as much as we know how to be and we're trying to we're trying to 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 put ourselves in those shoes to try to to uh you know to feel that pain as much as possible with you and then that said also we're encouraging you speak out stop stop this madness 
we're going to destroy our country if we continue to do what we're doing because it's going to cause an even greater racial divide. And that's not what we want. We want a solution. We want to hold people accountable when they do stupid, ignorant, and outrageous things like this officer did. He has to be held accountable, and so do the others, whatever that looks like. And let's work on the, the justice system. And, and I know you wanted to say one more thing about the local communities as yeah. well. So a lot of what I've seen also on social media the past couple days um, for when I get on there, because honestly, it's, it's just a lot. Um, but what I've seen, it's like, you know, the black community is saying, yes, white people, we want you to speak out. We want you to do the Blackout Tuesday. But we also want you to to support us to to be there for us and to tangibly do things you know whether that means donating to organizations or or whatever so i think we'd be remiss to not say how we can tangibly support and be there for the black community i think the first thing you said was if we blatantly see or if you blatantly see racism happening in front of you maybe it's even at your dinner table you know, where it's not even overt, like you see someone in the street being discriminated against, but maybe it's at your dinner table where I don't, some of your family says something, and it could be completely like they don't mean anything by it, but maybe it's just you saying, hey, you probably shouldn't say that. That You might not recognize it, but that has racist undertones. Right. Um, you know, it could be that. Um, also... I know everyone is hurting right now financially with the coronavirus and then this, the looting and the rioting on top of the past several months that we've been through with the coronavirus, but specifically in regards to the black community, just to show solidarity with them. Maybe it means you finding um, black owned businesses, um, you know, that you can support and go out of your way to just say, hey, I'm here with you. I want you to know I support you. One of the other things that I've seen on social media when it comes to families with small children, I've seen several people who have found literature for their children, children's books that have, um, you know, not just white people in them, not just white kids, but um, they have black illustrations and black children in them as well. It might sound small and silly, but it's at least a step to, to normalize and to, you know, prepare the next generation to even further mitigate the the risk of racism entering their lives. And then also, the last thing I would say as to what we can tangibly do is we can vote. Um, we can vote for our, um, our leaders that we want to be in office that are going to fight against racism. And I, if it's okay, I want to read, um, you know, because I've seen, you know, on social media, I've seen people blame the president for uh, President Trump for all of the, you know, the rioting, the protesting, the the incident itself with George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery. Um, so I, I found this interesting when I read this. This is a statement from our former president, Barack Obama, to kind of put it in perspective of specifically police brutality. Um, he says, um, it'll take me just a second, this is an excerpt from what he posted on social media, so you can find the whole thing uh, on there as well. He says, moreover, it's important for us to understand which levels of government have the biggest impact on our criminal justice system and police practices. When we think about politics, a lot of us focus only on the presidency and the federal government. And yes, we should be fighting to make sure that we have a president, a Congress, a U.S. Justice Department, and a federal judiciary that actually recognize the ongoing corrosive role that racism plays in our society and want to do something about it. But the elected officials who matter most in reforming police departments and the criminal justice system work at the state and local levels. He goes on to say, it's mayors and county executives that appoint most police, chief, police chiefs and negotiate collective bargaining agreements with police unions, it's district attorneys and state attorneys that decide whether or not to investigate and ultimately charge those involved in police misconduct. Those are all elected positions. And then he goes on to say a little bit more. But I say that to say, um, you know, we do have elections coming up, you know, here the next several months, and then obviously in November for the presidency. But I say that to say, 
that's a, our former president, our former black president, who's saying our voting matters most in when it comes to police brutality and you know police department decisions. It matters most in our local elections because that's where we you know vote those people in and um, you know our uh, attorneys and you know of that sort. So that's another tangible way to make sure that we're doing our part in making sure that when we're looking at the people who are running for office in our local elections, to look and say, do, are they overtly anti-racist? You know, are they going to speak out and are they making their voice heard that they're, yeah. you know. And I would say this one last thing as well. Don't just make an assumption that one particular party represents yeah. you. Because it'd be easy, and, and I'm not going to get political. I don't. I try to stay away from those things uh, from church because I'm I'm a pastor of 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 people. I'm not a pastor of a party, but I do have a particular persuasion, and I would be happy individually to share any of my thoughts individually. You know, not necessarily publicly, but individually with you. That that, that you know, if you had questions about. But I will say this. There are there have been times in the past where parties you think represent you and 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 it, and you may think that that is really their heart behind it, but in reality, if you dig a little deeper, you might find out that that that's not necessarily the case. Go find out. Go look and and be willing to be proven wrong. Be willing, but don't don't just assume things. Be willing to think for yourself. Be willing to think outside of just because your family or just because your community is this or that be willing to think for yourself and look at the issues that are at hand and judge the individuals as to be quality individuals that that truly represent you and by doing that we will make a difference in our local community our state and on a federal level as well well to your point um i'm not going to say what it is but if you look up the political officials, um, local officials in the city of where George Floyd was, you can see what party, again, not to get political, but to be educated, to understand, to your point, what you're saying, um, you can look that up and see, you know, where that community lies with their elected officials. Yes. And so don't make assumptions, be an individual. And, and most of all, be a God-led individual. We're going to close with this. We love you. Our heart is for you. Our heart is to, to represent everybody. I, we couldn't care less at Kingsway Church whether somebody is white, some, whether they're black, they're Asian, they're Hispanic, they're from another nationality. We couldn't care less about that because we see you as a person. And our goal as a, as a ministry at Kingsway Church is to be a blessing preach the gospel, share the good news, be a representative of Jesus Christ, and, uh, and we would love to see our, our church building full of people with all kinds of different uh, cultures and backgrounds. And, and we might not, maybe we wouldn't have somebody come in from China or from uh, uh, Vietnam or somewhere. I might not understand your culture and I might not understand everything about it, but we're willing to like rub elbows with, well, <laughs> when we can't rub elbows with you, <laughs> we're willing to connect with you and learn more about what makes you tick. And, uh, but the bottom line is, is we love you. We want to be Christians and we want to, we want to represent Jesus the way that he said to do it. And that is to N not not separate not separate and not divide but pull unity together amen. amen god bless you thank you so much for being with us this evening we love you and we look forward to seeing you come out this sunday i have a great message this sunday i believe is going to minister to you and uh and be a blessing to you so god bless you thank you for being with us this evening we love you amen <laughs>